So we're just putting putting. Uh, so it's a couple of minutes to one. It's a couple of minutes to the hour. So for all of those who are listening in, uh, my name's Gemma Van Halder, and we'll be starting this session in a in a few minutes. Um, certainly. Um, while, while we are waiting, if you haven't used MS Teams before, you'll see on the screen there, there is a, a picture of the functionality bar that's in MS Teams. And we do certainly encourage you to keep your microphone on mute and your camera off, particularly if you've got broadband issues. Um, but our, our staff here at SCAP will um, assist with the muting uh, if we need to. And then we'll have time for questions at the end. So we'll just wait another minute or two before we, we, we start. Thanks, Panita. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to our Asia Pacific Statistics Cafe today. My name is Gemma Van Haldren. It's a real pleasure to be joining you uh, for our discussion today with um, three, three expert panelists with a lot of experience and perspectives on this very broad ranging topic of data integration. SCAP's really happy to, to be join, uh, having you join us in this Stats Cafe series. We've introduced this series around June this year in response to, to the COVID-19 lockdown, and we've been really happy with the response um, on um, in bringing, bringing you some information and expertise on a variety of different statistical topics. Today's topic is on a, top, a subject matter that's very dear to my heart, data integration and the power of data integration uh, as a new modality and a new methodology for use across the official statistics community. This cafe is being recorded and we'll be sharing um, pre um, the presentations with you um, later. Um, I do encourage you, we have got three speakers and we will have plenty of time at the end for questions and answers. So we'll present all three speakers and then allow question and answer at the end. The um, MS Teams, if you have not used this technology before, uh, in the, if you bring your uh, mouse into the middle of the screen, there is a control bar that looks a little bit like the picture on your screen at the moment. Um, the third icon along is a hand. You, if you can press that hand, raise to speak. In the, in the question and answer session, we'll come to you and um, bring your questions to the, our three panelists. We'll also be keeping an eye on the meeting chat and certainly you can put your questions and uh, questions in there. And you can also, if you do have some answers to some of the questions coming from our audience, feel free to put in your perspectives as well. So without further ado, um, I, will, I will sort of introduce you to our three panelists now. We have brought to you, we've been working on this topic of data integration un, under the guidance of our Committee on Statistics for the last few months through a community of practice 
um, that's trying to bring together information and sharing of our of our um, journeys. And we've been um, using a lot of the expertise that's already developed in um, the European region, the UNECE region. Many of uh, Asia Pacific is also part of the UNECE work. And so I'm very pleased to have Mr. Steve Vale, the Regional Advisor for Statistics from UNECE, who'll share with us some work on um, data integration journey so far. We then have Dr. Su Ming Tam, who's the Honorary Professor Fellow with the University of Wollongong, Australia, but you also may know um, um, Dr. Su Ming Tam when he was the chief methodologist at the Australian Bureau of Statistics, and certainly that's where I had uh, many years working uh, with Su Ming, um, not only as the chief methodologist, but in a variety of different careers that Su Ming had at the Australian Bureau of Statistics. He's got a very illustrious career there with the International Association of Official Statistics, working many subject fields, not only in Australia, but in Hong Kong and um, really pleased. He, he really knows a lot about this topic of uh, data integration, so it's great that we've been able to attract uh, Su Ming to come and talk with us today. And then our third seeker is Ms. Aishan Soltek Osiek, who's the head expert on financial reporting department in the Turkey uh, National Statistics Office. And I'm really particularly pleased to have uh, Aishan with us today. Um, coming from the Central Bank of Turkey and sharing with us an area of data integration that often we don't realise is also a form of data integration, bringing together integrated sectoral accounts, um, putting to, together financial statistics. This is a really vital part of the integration journey in all of our statistical offices and I'm really pleased that we've got um, uh, Aishan with us today. So on that note, I'd really uh, first of all like to now hand over to Steve um, from UNECE to share with us the journey so far in uh, ECE. Thank you very much, Steve. And we have you on. Thank you. Sorry. That's it. Sorry, it was just taking a little while for the unmute to work. Uh, hopefully you see the slides. Yes. yes. Great. So thanks, Gemma. As, as you said, I'm the regional advisor in statistics at UNECE in Geneva. And before that, I was leading our work on uh, modernization. And even longer before that, I've been involved in various uh, projects and activities on administrative data and uh, other forms of data integration. So I'm going to talk about our, our work on data integration and I've put a bit of a strange title up here, A Journey to Where, but hopefully that will become clear as we go through the presentation. So I'm basically going to talk about past, present and future, uh, what we've done, uh, what we've found and where we think uh, data integration is going next. So just to reiterate what Gemma was saying a few minutes ago, Data integration isn't new, uh, so national accounts, as you'll, you'll hear from Aishan later, is uh, a key example of data integration. And the SNA, the, the core standard for national accounts, is already over 60 years old. Here in UNECE as well, uh, over the years, we've had a, a number of activities relating to data integration, even before the term data integration became popular. So guidelines on using registers uh, for censuses, on using administrative and secondary sources in statistics, etc. These are all available on our website if anybody's interested. Then about six years ago, we started really uh, seriously looking at some of the new data sources and we launched a big data project this was a, a two-year project under the high-level group for the modernization of official statistics. Uh, we had about 30 countries involved, over 100 experts, uh, all trying different experiments with different types of big data and looking at issues around uh, privacy, quality, confidentiality, etc. So 
This project ran for two years. We had many interesting findings, doing all sorts of wonderful things with uh, Twitter data, with mobile phone data, etc. But really, the main conclusion at the end of the two years is that big data are not the answer to all of the problems of official statistics. When we started the project, there was a lot of hype. Everybody thought big data was the future. And I think our project concluded that big data is not the future, but it's part of the future. And that really integrating data from many different sources is the most uh, productive way forward. Uh, we have on the slide the, the reference for the big data project, uh, if you're interested. So we followed up on that project with uh, a data integration project. Uh, we had Janine Borowick, also from the Australian Bureau of Statistics. She just retired at that time. Uh, we had participants from a, a whole list of countries uh, you can see on the screen. And as these projects typically are, this one was mostly virtual. Uh, so calls like this every couple of weeks or so but also a few sprint type workshops, really intensive workshops uh, in Hungary and Serbia and so on. First year of the project was really about gaining experience by collaborating. So seeing what other countries were doing and trying to share experiences and good ideas and tried then to formulate those into some sort of recommendations or best practices. That's ended up as a sort of initial guidance on a quality framework for data integration. The second year was really more about formalizing all of that information and knowledge into a guide for data integration. And that's also available on our, our website. Uh, also some more joint experiments and looking at some very practical interest areas. So here's the link to the outputs from that project. Uh, again, all available on our, our wiki site if you're interested to see more. Now, one of the outcomes of the data integration project was a, a growing recognition, which we were also seeing appearing in different parts of the statistical community at that time, about the importance of linking statistical and geospatial data. So really integrating official statistics with location information. And we have the slogan that appears in many places that everything happens somewhere. So geography, a geolocation can be an important uh, key to integrating statistical and other data. Now here's something from very early in my career, about 25 years ago, which sort of illustrates this, again, before really data integration became a popular term. And this is just looking at comparing coverage between a statistical business register and a telephone directory in the UK. And we produced all sorts of really detailed tables, but it was only when we produced this fairly simple map that we really saw the picture, that we really saw where the coverage differences were, where our business register was deficient, and perhaps where it uh, scored better than the telephone directories. And we learnt a lot from this. We really managed to improve the quality and the coverage of the business register. So it's an example here of how integrating location with statistical information can really give quite a, a lot of useful information uh, to make decisions, to improve quality, etc. So the next step for us was to bring together some experts and really talk about this topic and see which directions we should go in. So we had a workshop on integrating statistical and geospatial information in Belgrade uh, last year. Uh, we managed to get about 100 participants. Uh, we more or less filled the room in the Serbian Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we had people from uh, pretty well every continent uh, joining this workshop. So it was really a very interesting and intense discussion. We also tried using a few interactive tools and that gave us some good information. This was the results of a poll about the areas of statistics that would benefit from greater integration 
of statistical and geospatial data. And you can see the, the top results were population, environment, transport, mobility, etc. We also asked about the challenges and here standards came out on top and that's a, a topic we're looking at in more detail at the moment. But also access to data and there we've been working with the geospatial community on trying to build uh, partnerships to improve the, the access, particularly to geospatial information. So on standards and frameworks, around the time of that workshop, a new standard came out, uh, global, geo, geo, sorry, global Statistical Geospatial Framework. And this was endorsed by the UN Statistical Commission last year. And this is something I would really recommend for anybody starting on the integration of statistical and geospatial data. And talking about starting points, I think really the key starting point for integration of geography and statistics is to geocode all of your statistical units. So all of your businesses, uh, households, uh, properties, etc ideally with XY coordinates, and that allows you then to define areas uh, for analysis or for dissemination, and you can start to develop and create or obtain boundary files to, to manage those areas. And if you have geocoded information for all of your units, your, all of your statistical units, then you can start to think about using location as the key to data integration. Now, this is a diagram I've adapted from several presentations I've seen over the last year, uh, including from Martin Brady at the Australian Bureau of Statistics. And the idea here is that if you have precise coordinates for people, property, businesses, jobs, etc., then you can use those coordinates as an integration key to link those uh, different units or different variables. And this is particularly important if you don't have systems of common identifiers in your country. Now this slide is really just to show that there are many initiatives uh, in this area and we're trying to engage with all of the ones that are relevant, particularly in the UNECE area. And as you see from the title, it's almost the case we have too many initiatives. So we're trying to build partnerships, build connections between the different initiatives and try to make sure that they're complementary and not overlapping. And that's quite a challenge for us at the moment. So just looking briefly to the future, uh, we're working at the moment on the generic statistical business process model from a geospatial perspective. And this is something that came out in the last revision of the GSBPM, how to better reflect geospatial information. So we have a new task team. Uh, it's met several times already this year, including yesterday. And we're about two thirds of the way through the GSBPM with the aim of producing a companion document that will explain how to use geospatial information uh, in statistical production and hopefully early next year for that. That's our target at the moment. Also a few ideas for the future. Uh, there have been a few discussions in the last six to nine months about statistical geospatial data architectures. Statistics Finland has uh, created a post of geospatial architect within their, their organization. Uh, Statistics Canada has developed a similar function. And we're looking to build on the idea of a geospatial view of the GSBPM and use that as a foundation for creating a data architecture for integrating statistical and geospatial information. Now, at the same time, we're also trying to integrate the communities because that facilitates the integration of the data. So we had, for example, a few weeks ago, a joint session of the Conference of European Statisticians, that's our governing body, with the UN GGIM Europe, the UN uh, Group on Geospatial Information for the Europe region. 
And we decided to have a, a joint task team to look at standards to see whether we can improve geospatial and statistical standards so that we can uh, improve interoperability between the data from the two communities. So that's something that we'll be starting in the coming months. So that's my summary of, of what we're doing and where we're going in UNECE. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, that was a really wonderful presentation and uh, the integration. I really uh, have a particular soft spot for the integration of um, information through the geo coordinated co coordinate, as you suggest there. Uh, so thank you very much for bringing in that geospatial uh, yes. integration. I'm, I'm now going to move to Dr. Su Ming Tam um, to talk to us about Statistical Frontier for Statistics. Su Ming, uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Gemma. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thanks a lot. Now, listening to Steve, maybe my title is not right. I should, not, I should probably not call it a new statistical frontier for official statistics because it's been doing it for the last 25 years. Maybe I call it a well-trotted statistical frontier. That's probably a more appropriate title. So, I got quite a number of slides, so I would uh, try to skip some of the methodology type of slides. Uh, and uh, there is references to us the end and probably questions. And if people want to know a bit more about methodology, I'll be very happy to answer them in uh, the Q&A session. So basically, there are five themes. I'll talk about uh, why, what and how for data integration, busting a big data myth. Uh, this comes back to Steve's earlier point that uh, big data is not the solution, but big data and survey data and some other data combined is actually the way to go. And concept called ABC of big data, which is trying to address the undercoverage problems of big data, repairing big data by mass imputation and also adjusting for linkage errors. Okay. Um, Data integration, why do we do it? I think uh, probably you all know about this. The current direct data collection is an expensive and increasing unsustainable business model for NSOs. And declining budgets, increasing demands all point to the reuse and repurposing. And also by combining data sets, the analytical value, the public value of the data set is actually significantly increased and is actually higher than each of the component data sets. So, uh, page down. Uh, now, there are, I would describe two types of um, data integration. The first, I call it a micro, a micro data, micro level integration. This is actually linking uh, data at the unit record level. And the other one is, I would call it macro level integration. And this is using the value of a big data set to try to improve uh, survey estimates. And in this talk, I'm going to try to explain some of these ideas, technical ideas in English. And um, I'll be using the term big data administrative data interchangeably. So data integration, there is actually a methodology uh, created by Federico Santa in 1969, because this is a community of practice, I assume everyone knows how to do this. But I think the key point that I want to point out is that we need to understand that the key uh, ingredient for this methodology is actually the agreement vector and also the Felicity Sunta weight. This weight are actually used to determine which record pairs is considered to be a match. Now, busting a big data myth, because a lot of people think big is good. So I just give an example where the population you has a million uh, people with 500,000 500, males and 500,000 females. Therefore, the proportion of male is 50%. Suppose we have a big data set B with 900,000 people with 500 males, 1,000 males and 400,000 females. Uh, and then if you compute the uh, proportion of male using big data set, it's actually 55.56%. So there is actually um, a response bias of 5.56%. So why do we have that bias? The reason is that the propensity 
of males included in a big data set, 500,000 out of 500,000 is 100%, but for females, 400,000 over 500,000 is 90%. So big, sorry, 80%, 400,000 over 500, 80%. So there's another, so the difference of 20% is defined as uh, the response bias. And that response bias is actually creating that sample bias of 5.56%. So I'll give you an example which uses uh, population 2016 Australian census data, where we're interested to find out the uh, proportion of English speaking at home. So here, um, there is a concept called effective sample size. If you use a big data set with under coverage, sampling error is very small, uh, probably new, but there is a, a bias. So the mean square error is going to be driven by the bias square. Uh, but if you've got a random sample, you've got a sampling error component, but because it's a probability sample, you've got no bias. Effective sample size means the equivalent of a big data sample size to a uh, probability sample. So in this case, I've got a population, a big data population of 50%, 11.7 million, which is half of the population of Australia in 2016. And if you've got a 10% response bias, then the effective sample size is only as good as a random sample of 127. So this tells you that, you know, this notion that the big is good is actually uh, not true. Okay. Now, this work actually uh, arises from uh, a piece of work by a professor from Harvard by the name of Professor Ming, and uh, the work that he created is called the Fundamental Theorem of Estimation Error. So going back to Steve Fon, how do we combine big data with survey data to improve survey estimates? So again, this is the so-called ABC of big data. A is a random sample, B is the uh, big data set, and C is the complement of the big data set in the population U. So I'm interested in descriptive inference, right? A lot of work in NSOs are trying to estimate population totals. So in this case, if I want to estimate the population total of U, it would be just simply the total of B plus the total of C. Very simple, right? And because B is big data fully observed and assuming for the moment, no measurement errors, no time lag and that kind of thing. So all we needed to do to estimate the total in U is to estimate the total in C. And the total in C can actually be estimated by this segment of the random sample. So this is basically the idea of the ABC uh, method for big data. But because of this particular um, insight, um, uh, sorry, uh, because of this, we can actually rewrite that equation in the form of calibration equation to calibrate the weights in A to match the population counts in B, C, and the total in B. And because of this calibration insight, we can actually extend the method to deal with uh, measurement errors in B or non-response errors in A, or even A and B have uh, different time periods. And the resulting estimator, we describe it as uh, RDI, uh, regression data integrator and estimating total is called RDI total. Now this concept will be used in the later part of the talk. So I'll give you an example of how um, powerful that combination of the two data sets is. We uh, ran an experiment using our 2016 agricultural census in Australia, which has got an 80% response rate. So we treat that 80% as a big data sample, a big data set. And then we got an annual survey called REAC, um, REACTS. So it's, a, it's an annual survey, sample survey of agricultural census, basically collect, collecting similar items. So if you use the survey data by itself, the mean square error is 6.2 units. If you use the X census data only without adjusting for the non response, you got a mean square error of 131 units. And if you use A and B together, you got a a mean square error 0 0.43. So comparing this with that, you got basically a 15 fold, a 15, something like that, a significant increase in the efficiency. So what's the benefit for um, NSOs with this type of analysis? And that is that you can 
literally reduce substantially the sample size of this, uh, but combining with B, you can still maintain the same mean square error. And that means that you got substantial savings in your operations. You're so up to got 10 minutes, 10 minutes, Suming. I'm up to 10. Okay. Yes. All right. So maybe I'll come to this point and, um, uh, and then I'll quickly run uh, the other parts. So this is another idea. So we've got the control total here. So we are using a mass imputation to impute the unit records uh, in C in such a way that when you add up the records in B, adding up the records in A, then you would get to the control total. And uh, in this work, in this project, we actually use a machine learning technique called KNN, K, K nearest neighbor algorithm, which is similar to the Dongna hot tech imputation. Hot tech imputation, if you like, is actually one NN. In this case, we use K, where K is a number to be determined. All right, so we have run an experiment and compared the prediction with the actual data. And if you look at the box plots, they look very similar, except for the fifth survey variable. And uh, that's, uh, that's uh, because the auxiliary variables are not very good in predicting this particular variable. Finally, I just talked very quickly about the uh, FS algorithm. It makes two assumptions, statistical independence and no linkage errors. But that's not a very realistic assumption because you've got two data sets coming from different collection modes, different instruments, and maybe different timing too. So you're bound to have measurement errors. So we uh, use a, a set of data from a book by um, uh, Efron and Tip Shirani. These two are giants in statistics and they created a, a methodology called bootstrapping. So in this case, the uh, red pairs are actually pairs with uh, linking error. So they're not the correct match pairs. So in a in an integrated data situation, you're given this match this set, and you don't know which pairs are actually uh, have linking error. So if you use a naive estimate, in this case we want to calculate a correlation coefficient, you come up with 0 0.51, and the actual one, if there are no measurement errors or linking errors, is 0 0.76. But using a method that we've developed in the ABS, we can actually adjust this value back to. 0 0.73, which is very close to 7.76. And we also did another thing uh, use that was a correlation coefficient. In this case, we're trying to do run a regression uh, analysis, again, using the hormone data in his book. The naive estimator for the intercept and the slope is this. The correct intercept and slope is this. Single bootstrap adjustment bring some good adjustment, but not good enough. And then uh, double bootstrap adjustment is actually giving you the desired result. And in the work that we did, we've actually also developed a stopping rule to know when we should stop. Is it single bootstrap, double bootstrap, or triple bootstrap? So this is my last slide. Okay. D data integration will be the future of official statistics because integrated data sets significantly increase the public value. Uh, the type one data set might provide misleading analytical inferences due to linking errors and could significantly impact on policy formulation and evaluation. And then combining big data and survey data can significantly improve the statistical efficiency of finite population estimates and leading to significant um, reduction in operating costs in NSOs. And there is also a method that we described earlier to impute for the missing data to actually repair, if you like, the big data set to make it a, a good data set for inference. And these are the references if you want to follow them up. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Su Ming. Um, and so I think that followed Steve's presentation extremely well. So, so lots of frameworks, lots of tools out there to um, use and guide you in your data integration approaches, but also there's emerging methodologies and um, emerging examples like the ones we've just seen from Su Ming in Australia on how to uh, deal with uh, quality issues 
uh, in both your linkage as well as in your data set. So, Su Ming, thank you very much for, for bringing us those, those examples and the efficiency you get by bringing the data sets together. Uh, very, very impressive. I'd now like to turn to our third speaker, uh, Ms. Aishan Stolti Osek, who's the head expert of financial reporting in the um, Central Bank of Turkey, uh, to lift us up to the level now of uh, sectorial accounts. Aishan, over to you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Good morning and good afternoon, uh, every everyone. Uh, now it uh, is just a minute, Aishan. I just asked. I just asked Su Ming if you could stop sharing and then we'll share your slides. Yes. Um, okay. Thank you. Thanks, Aishan. Yeah. So have I done that? <clears throat> yes, that's good. Thank you, Su Ming. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Aishan, over to you. <clears throat> yes. Uh, good morning again. Uh, so you uh, see my screen, right? Uh, uh, not just at the moment. Um, okay. So <laughs> okay, now I'm going to share. Not quite yet. Okay. Now? Um, yes, and just put it on slideshow from the beginning. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I now see that it is 179 participants right now. It's really uh, challenging and I'm really excited. And thanks for this opportunity to uh, for uh, having this uh, online webinar. And uh, now I will talk about how we integrate uh, sector accounts of Turkey. Uh, I will share our experience or what we have done. Uh, first of all, I would like to talk uh, what is the background and motivation of this integration process uh, for us. Uh, as you all know, following the uh, global financial crisis, G uh, sorry, uh, G20 countries has endorsed uh, the Data Gaps Initiative uh, for in, in have more reliable and timeless statistics for uh, policy use. And this, uh, in these recommendations, uh, Data Gaps Initiative, there were 20 recommendations filed, and uh, one of them was the uh, compilation of internal uh, integrated sectoral accounts of Turkey, uh, integrated sectoral accounts, in order to uh, have, uh, in order to predict the vulnerabilities and spillovers between the uh, sectors. At the European level, uh, ECB, European Central Bank, compiles integrated sector accounts consisting of financial and non-financial accounts of euro area. This was another motivation for us. And uh, again, at the uh, European level, Euro Statistical Office for the European Communities uh, defined the consistency, uh, the need for consistency between financial and non-financial accounts in order to have uh, integrated accounts. Um, okay, so uh, what is integrated uh, accounts? Oh, sorry, I, I cannot well. <laughs> sorry, I, uh, I jump from uh, <coughs> one slide to another. Uh, what is uh, the integrated accounts, uh, they link both financial and non-financial accounts in the system of national accounts. Uh, so it allows for an integrated analysis of non-financial economic activities, such as uh, gross fixed capital formation and uh, financial transactions, uh, like uh, issues of debt. Here you can see a chart from the uh, ECB's ECB and uh, Eurostat website. Uh, it shows us the euro area net lending and net borrowing uh, divided by uh, SNA sectors of households, non financial corporations, financial corporations, government, and uh, for, for the whole euro area. Uh, here above the line is the uh, non financial accounts, 
and below the line is the financial accounts. So when we integrate, we could uh, have uh, have the uh, from financial from non-financial world to financial world uh, is transferred. In the uh, sequence of accounts, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, Afsana, can you please uh, uh, control my uh, control my slides? Yes, yes, yes. I, I, I will because share it slightly. I, I will share yes, it. Please. No worries, okay. no worries. Okay. Okay, I stopped sharing. Yeah. Because I, I couldn't do it very well. Okay, I can do it for you. Just, just tell me next, and uh, there would be a bit delay before. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No okay. problem. Okay, so you can see my screen now. Uh, yes. It's coming. Okay, I'm on the fourth slide, by the way. Okay, is it your slide? Sequence fourth of accounts? Slide. slide number four. Uh, okay, is it, is it up now? Yes, because slide I... four. Okay. Okay, thank Go you. Go ahead, Aysan. It's fine. Uh, <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. Here in the system of national accounts, uh, we divide the, uh, all the system into four quadrants, let's say. Above the line, it is non-financial accounts, uh, which describes us the uses of uh, uses and resources, how goods and services are produced in the economy in terms of uses, and how these goods and uh, services are consumed in terms of resources. When we have the uh, balancing item, net lending and borrowing above the line for the uh, national economy, then we will have these uh, uh, in the below the line, the financial accounts how these uh, uh, uses are uh, acquired in terms of financial assets and what kind of liabilities are incurred in terms of resources. Next, please. Okay. Um, Afsana, we're still on slide four. Okay. I, I have I have moved to the five. Five? Okay. Yeah, I can yeah. see what if everybody uh, okay, sorry. sorry. So if you can see I sound, go ahead. Okay, I I I continue. Yes, Afsana, it's still on slide four and, and people can't see the slides. So okay. maybe Maybe Aishan, yeah. I can I can try it again because I can see it uh, on my computer. Okay. Just, just just a moment. So some just, people just can see my part. Just a moment, please. Aishan, maybe if you keep talking, uh, Aishan, while we get up. Okay. Slide okay. Thank you. Yes. Uh, integrated sector accounts uh, consist of uh, a sequence of accounts describing production, generation, and distribution of income, and capital accumulation. Capital accumulation items in the accounts include value added, disposable income, and net lending and borrowing. They allow for an integrated analysis of non-financial economic acti activities and uh, financial transactions showing how economic value is generated and distributed in the economy. So we can understand how savings are invested and how investment is financed. <clears throat> and they are all based on institutional sectors, <clears throat> sorry, following the methodological framework in the SNA 2008. Uh, so, can I move on to the next one? Okay. Okay. Uh, the sequence of accounts can be broken down into current and accumulation accounts. And the current accounts show the transactions relating to production, income generated by production, and subsequent distribution and redistribution of incomes, and the use of income, consum income for consumption and saving purposes. And the accumulation accounts record flows that affect the balance sheets and consist of capital and financial accounts. 
And together, these accounts represent the changes in the stocks, uh, stock accounts, or balance sheets. The closing balance sheet show assets and liabilities at uh, market prices at the end of uh, the period and divided by into five institutional sectors. And the closing balance sheet for one year is equal to the opening balance sheet of the next year. And the balancing items can be identified as net financial assets and net wealth. <clears throat> and these accounts are integrated in <coughs> sorry, three dimensions. Uh, in terms of horizontal, vertical, and in terms of stock flow consistency. So when we integrate, we have to have a horizontal check, vertical check, and stock flow consistency check. Here, uh, the horizontal consistency means that total uses in the economy should be equal to total resources, and total financial assets should be equal to total liabilities for each of the financial and non-financial accounts in the transaction category and each of the financial balance sheet category. When we summed up uh, or summed, uh, over all institutional sectors and the rest of the world. Uh, next, please. Uh, in the uh, vertical consistency requires that for each sector and the rest of the world, the balance of all current and capital transactions should be equal to balance of all financial transactions. So here the change in the balance sheet is for each asset category equal to some of the transactions and other changes such as revaluation of assets, which gives us the stock flow consistency. Uh, this, were, uh, this was the theoretical background of integrated sector accounts. Now I would like to move on. Next, please. A move on the uh, compilation of uh, sectoral accounts, uh, so, uh, I mean integrated accounts. Still, we don't have this, right? Uh, we, we, we are on a slide eight, Aysan. Okay, I can uh, see, but I share. Okay, okay, you share. It's fine. We're coming up to 10 minutes, Aishan, 10 minutes. Okay, yes. Uh, in Turkey, what we have done to integrate this uh, sector accounts, first, uh, in, uh, uh, I mean, this, uh, there are two, uh, two institutions involved uh, in these accounts. Non-financial accounts is compiled by the Turkish Statistical Office, NSO, and the financial accounts by the Central Bank. So uh, in 2012, uh, sector financial accounts uh, have been started to be uh, compiled uh, in a sector-wise approach by the central bank. And uh, in um, 2000, sorry, in 2015, uh, the uh, Turkstat uh, published for the first time the annual non-financial accounts uh, at sector level. So we uh, compiled the integrated accounts working group in uh, 2017 and started working uh, in the data. Uh, if we look at the data sources of the sector of financial accounts, we see that it is uh, quite uh, secondary uh, statistics. We use national accounts, money and banking statistics, security statistics, government finance statistics, BOP and uh, international investment position. Uh, in general, uh, non-financial corporations' data in countries are administrative data, and uh, some parts are counterpart data. In uh, financial corporations, again, it is administrative data and money and banking data for, for, from uh, counterpart uh, data. Uh, general government uh, accounts are also uh, used as mostly based on administrative data, and government finance statistics. And households uh, are compiled by counterpart data and survey data. And for the non-profit organizations, it's again the administrative data and counterpart data is used. And for the rest of the world, it is international investment position and balance of payments data. And uh, also at the instrument level, we have uh, these uh, lower, uh, at, uh, at the lower level table, I show the uh, data sources, how they are varied uh, according to uh, instruments. 
So what we have done in the integrated accounts working group with these different data sources, uh, is we started to use same administrative data. If there is administrative data in one sector, both institutions started to use the same administrative data. And missing, uh, if there are some missing subsector data, they are integrated. Uh, and we identified that we had different data coverage. So we tried to uh, make them similar data coverage. And here was the key in terms of data coverage is, the, is our methodology based on the SNA 2008. Also, we uh, uh, constructed some bridge tables from balance of payments from GFS into the financial accounts. Also, the revision policies are uh, integrated. So when we compile the, uh, uh, the non-financial and financial data after we integrate, uh, we also- We need to wrap up in a minute. A minute, please, Aizan. A minute. Okay, so there are some uh, coherence indicators that we have done. Uh, dividing by net, uh, uh, net lending and borrowing in financial and non-financial accounts. There are still inconsistencies, of course, that we are working on. And uh, what we, to conclude, uh, we fully adapted uh, for uh, BOP and IIP for the sector of financial accounts, for these uh, integrated sector accounts. Also, we integrated different data sources, different coverage, and uh, eliminated the time lag in revisions, improved the sector coverage in financial corporations, and uh, we uh, decided to make simultaneous revisions in two institutions. So our uh, target is to have integrated sector accounts for uh, Turkey. I want to thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much. And sorry for sorry for um, pushing you along there. Um, but excellent presentation, and I really think it showed 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 that uh, even at the macro level, when you're integrating macro, you know, aggregate statistics, you're still having to make adjustments for lags in times for different data sources. And uh, you know, really really great example there. Um, and and for a really key statistic, our our system of national accounts. Um, now we've come to we've come to the the question and answer part of our session, and there's three there's three questions in the chat box. But um, Afsana, do you want to manage the questions, or would you like um, um, a hand over to you, or how would you like to okay. do this? Okay, then I can do it. Uh, actually, we have also collected a few questions uh, during the registration, so maybe I can start uh, from those. Uh, in using non-traditional data sources, there exist uh, challenges such as difference in scope, covered uh, population reference period, and quality of data. The question is now that uh, how can official statistics uh, statisticians ensure that data are of good quality? How can they decide which sources to use and the, how uh, the organization can address this issue? Maybe, uh, Aysan, could you elaborate on how your organization addresses the quality issue and if you have different sources for one data, how you decide which source to use? Okay, this is uh, quite the challenge, I mean, to have the data quality when you have uh, more than one data source for the same uh, statistics. So what we have done in Turkey uh, is to pr we prioritized uh, the data. We had a data hierarchy, uh, and we had some uh, this data hierarchy. First of all, for example, in uh, government sector data, if we had administrative data at one hand, uh, Minister of Finance data, and GFS data, so we think that. The most reliable one is the one which has uh, international standards, which has uh, some methodological background, is, is the most reliable data. Uh, make this data hierarchy according to reliability. So the reliable one is the GFS for government sector data for us, uh, because it uses government finance statistics manual of the IMF. Uh, and also it is uh, classified according to the um, uh, sectors and instruments defined in the SNA. 
And for example, in money and banking statistics uh, or banking uh, sector accounts, uh, we use money and banking statistics of the central bank. Why? Because it is a, a long time uh, statistics that is uh, compiled and published uh, and disseminated uh, according to the international standards, which has metadata. This is also another uh, another criteria that should be uh, considered when you get uh, when you have to uh, consider the data quality. So I think the key here is to have uh, to uh, various data sets to communicate within each other. Is the uh, rules, uh, accounting rules, concepts, definition, and standards. And our uh, guide is the SNA. If uh, one data set is uh, uh, disseminated according to SNA, it is the most reliable one, which is at the higher level of the hierarchy. Uh, then we eliminated the other ones. But we also um, try to match with other sources uh, at the very beginning to have the best quality uh, for each of the transactions if it is the best data set. This is, I think, a, a shortcut uh, to have the best quality, but it worked. Uh, it worked a lot in, uh, in the case of Turkey. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, the other uh, question uh, is for uh, Xiaoming that uh, when we want to disseminate official statistics, when we have used uh, different sources, what sort of um, considerations we should uh, take and uh, what, what are the instructions that we should uh, provide to the users of the official statistics? Over to you, Simi. Mm -hmm. Integrated data sets is a, uh, one of the outputs of uh, the National Statistical Office. And you might recall that many, many years ago, there was a big campaign for uh, producing official statistics accompanied by so-called quality declarations and quality statements. So the quality declarations, are, if you like looking at the quality of the collection as a whole, whereas the quality statements are actually describing the quality of the individual data items. So I think that sort of approach would still would also apply to an integrated data set. So an integrated data set is just a regular statistical output. So you could describe the quality of the collection itself. In this case, there are actually two or multiple collections involved, depending on how many data sources you augment them together, uh, but also the quality statements. But for data integration, uh, for data integration, there are some additional things that I think would be would be necessary. For example, for the sort of adjustment to deal with coverage bias, I would need additional information on whether the method used to do the data linking is probabilistic method or deterministic data linking method, uh, whether blocking was used in the data linking, and what are the true positive and false positive probabilities because we actually need these probabilities to replicate, to apply the bootstrap method. So, so things that are, that are unique to this special operation would be worthwhile to be provided in either the quality declaration or the quality statement to assist the user to make appropriate judgment on the fitness of purpose of the data set. Thank you very much, Siming. And uh, one question for you, Steve, is that uh, what are some of the requirements, including the institutional uh, environment, infrastructure, the software, hardware specifications for efficient data integration? OK, thank you. So great question. I think I'll, I'll focus mostly on the institutional environment because I think that's the foundation. And there you need a good legal basis. You need uh, legislation in place that will allow data sharing, that will give the statistical office uh, access to the, the various data sources it needs. And I just looked through the participants list. I see people on the list from Armenia and Kyrgyzstan, and I know that they've recently introduced new statistical laws based on something called the generic law of official statistics. 
which has exactly those provisions in. So getting the legislation right is, is the first step. Then it's important to start developing agreements, so something like a memorandum of understanding with the data providers, so that you have a clear understanding of uh, what they will provide and when and how. Then also in terms of the, the sort of institutional environment, it's important to try to standardize as much as possible between the data sources. Ideally, this would go as far as uh, common, unique identifiers for units, but I know that's not always possible. Even when that's not possible, though, standardization on classifications and definitions can be a big help. Now, the infrastructure, software and hardware depends a lot on the types of data sources, uh, the size of the sources, etc. So I'll just mention in terms of software, uh, there's some free uh, GIS software, uh, Geospatial Information System software called QGIS, and there's an excellent book released recently uh, by the Pacific community on Q QGIS for census and survey mapping. That's a really good manual there. Also for record linkage, there's some really good software by the Italian statistical office, uh, ISTAT. Uh, this is a software tool called Relice which is a sort of a dashboard where you can use different record linkage uh, methods on your, your data, depending on the type of data you have. And they're both free and open and sort of available to anybody. Uh, in terms of hardware, then again, that depends on the data source. But one thing a few statistical organizations are looking at is whether they can do some of the processing at the source so that they don't have to have huge storage and huge processing capacity in-house. So if you have, for example, a big data set, rather than taking a copy of it and bringing it into the statistical office to see if it's possible to do some of the processing at least at the source and maybe take some aggregates instead of all of the microdata. So they're just a few ideas that are, are being tried around the statistical community at the moment. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, I can see questions uh, in the chat, but some of them have been already answered. So since it's two o'clock now, maybe we wrap up here. Uh, uh, we will we will pose the questions to the speakers and uh, we will uh, collect their answers and we'll email to the uh, participants who have uh, raised that question later. So uh, maybe uh, back to you, Gemma. Yeah, thank you very much, Afsana. And uh, yes, there was some questions in the box, but we did answer a lot of them um, uh, around, you know, you can use data integration for integrating macro or aggregates, as we saw in the case of Turkey. In fact, all of you do it in your national accounts. Uh, also with microdata and Su Ming shared you the example there with microdata. Um, we've also shared some examples of integrating geo-reference data around SEER accounts for land, land use and la land cover mapping. Um, so as Afsana said, thank you so much everybody for your, your presentations today. We will be sharing a recording of this video and the presentations on our website. Um, I would um, just like to highlight three things in closing. The first one is this topic of data integration, apart from the massive audience we've had today, um, is was a really big topic at our recent Asia Pacific Statistics Week held um, early a few months ago. Um, and I know many, uh, many of your staff in your statistical offices are very interested in this topic of data integration. And uh, SCAP's currently working with um, a few of your staff trying to develop uh, papers for the statistical journal, the IOS, and uh, I'd like to put out a particular call out to our colleagues in the Statistical Centre of Iran, Saeed Fayaz and Reza Fuzzy, who are working with us at the moment on sharing, showcasing integration in the area of price statistics and household um, expenditure and income surveys. We will send out an uh, evaluation form uh, as part of this about, uh, today. And I'd like to, before thanking our speakers, I'd like to highlight that next week we're going to be doing a cafe on um, a, method, a new methodology for measuring illicit financial flows. 
Um, we're working, ESCAP has joined uh, partners with um, the UN Office of Drugs and Crime and the uh, Conference of Trade and Development to um, work with you and we're looking for countries in Asia Pacific who would like to trial a development of a new methodology on measuring illicit financial flows. So if this is a topic of interest to you and your country, please reach out and uh, listen in next week to our cafe. So in closing, thank you again. I would particularly like to thank uh, Steve from UNECE, uh, Su Ming Tam from Australia, um, and uh, Ms. Aishan Oshek from the Tur Central Bank of Turkey. Three excellent presentations, uh, three excellent um, contributions to this very broad ranging topic of data integration. And thank you everybody for being part of today's cafe. Have, have a lovely day and see you again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, bye. Bye.